metres to go. Let's bring him home. This is history unfolding on the streets of Vienna this morning. It's a Saturday run like we've never seen before. Listen at the noise. The crowd getting right behind him. Elliot Kipchoge storms into the history books in Vienna. 1.59.40, the unofficial time. The first man to run a marathon in under two hours. Hi, I'm Jack Rayner, an Australian distance runner, and you're listening to The Physical Performance Show. And the winner is... Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to The Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by PhysioCrem and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll aim to bring you the latest and the greatest inspiration and information on all things physical performance here on the show. We do this through a range of episodes, including featured performers, expert editions, interest editions, and coaches' corners. And this week, we're jumping over to a featured performer episode and featuring a guest who recently played an instrumental role in Elliot Kipchoge's historic sub-two-hour marathon. That's right, today's featured performer is none other than Aussie up-and-coming running sensation Jack Rayner. It's likely that you will never forget where you were when you were tuning in on the 12th of October 2019 when Kenyan Elliot Kipchoge, current Olympic marathon champion and world record holder, made history by clocking an incredible 159.40.2 for the marathon. That's a per kilometre average of 250 across the 42.2 kilometres. And right there on the streets of Vienna on the 12th of October, as one of 41 fellow pace runners, was Jack Rayner. On today's episode, we'll start by exploring the role that Jack played in Elliot Kipchoge's historic Ineos 159 challenge run. And of course, we'll cover Jack's highs, lows, and the learnings of his incredible running career to date. By way of bio, 23-year-old Jack Rayner at the time of recording has tasted success in the Gold Coast Airport Marathon Half Marathon, the Sunshine Coast Half Marathon, and the Cardiff Half Marathon. Jack's current PB across this distance is 10101. And in the London 2019 Marathon, Jack debuted with an impressive 2.11.06, placing 14th and running an Athletics Australia qualifying time for the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. Jack trains under super coach Nick Badeau of the Melbourne Track Club. And as mentioned at the top of the show, Jack gained some real traction internationally when he was the lead pace runner running at the front on the far right side of Elliot Kipchoge for both the first five kilometres and also the last five kilometres of the historic Ineos 159 Challenge. To see Jack in action, jump over to the show notes. You'll find the YouTube footage there. Now, at the time of recording, Jack Rayner was just over one week away from participating in the 2019 New York City Marathon. We touch on Jack's preparation for the marathon, some of his favorite sessions. Jack survives a performance round, outlines his three top tips for marathon performance and what he's learned about fueling for marathons. But let's start with the role Jack played in Ineos 159, Elid Kipchoge's historic sub two hour marathon. Jack Rayner, this is a real treat. You are the talk of the running world with your mighty feats in the recent Ineos 159 or 159 Challenge. So welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Cheers, Brad. Thanks for having me on. Jack, let's start with the obvious. Uh, The world was watching uh, as Elliot Kipchoge 
so beautifully went sub two hours in the uh, the Ineos Challenge, and you, Jack, were there right from the get go uh, on the starting line. Two runners to the right of Elliot Kipchoge, and then you were there right at the finish when yep. Elliot issued command or order, and he stormed home for that two forty last kilometre. Uh, and you were prime time. The moustache you're sporting, uh, there you were. You couldn't miss Jack Rayner. So, Jack, we're in the, the weeks following Ineos 159. How has life changed for you since then? Uh, hasn't changed really too much because we were only there for uh, uh, the weekend pretty much. But, yeah, uh, yeah, did get a pretty lucky with the first leg and obviously the last leg. So, yeah, a lot of new followers on Strava and Instagram and stuff. But besides that, um, pretty much been the same. I've got two burning questions to ask you about the challenge. The first is, what did Elliot say uh, when he, you guys were almost like the Red Sea? You parted your your team of runners, pacemakers, and Elliot stormed up for that two forty last k. And then obviously, you know, you guys consciously sat further back uh, just to let him, yeah. you know, take take the limelight, so to speak. But but what did Elliot say? Did he say anything? Not so much himself, but we kind of they kind of told us about everything besides the last kilometer and they they just said we don't really know what's going to happen because if anything was going to go wrong it was probably going to be in that last sort of 5k's because that was kind of the hardest part for him i'd say but yeah they just told us that they might be pulling us out a bit early they didn't say how early but yeah i think it got to um yeah just over about 41 bit over 41 kilometers and then um elliot's manager valentine on the bike just said to everyone elliot's feeling good everyone pull out to the side and then I think a few of the paces didn't even hear him properly and then they kind of stuck in and then he was just shouting at them but the crowd was just so loud wow um, yeah it took it took about 100 meters before everyone realized yeah, okay right we've got to slow down and give Elliot his time to shine which he um which he did, certainly did I mean the adrenaline must have been high so uh the crowd was drowning out some of the the commands and it was right on about 158 one hour 58 that I think uh that happened yeah. and then uh I mean you're following Elliot you know, in the, in the white singlet, you guys are in the black, the pace, pace makers. What's going through your head as you're looking at the clock and you're realising that he's well inside the sub two marathon, Jack? So uh, we didn't know for sure and probably until uh, a few cases ago that he was definitely going to do it because um, when you're running at the front, you've got the crowd there the whole way. You can't actually hear Elliot. You can't even see him. You don't really want to look behind to see if he's still there because otherwise you'd be running off your line, which you don't want to do. So um, kind of once we got around that last roundabout, um, we knew for sure that he'd be able to do it because it was only a couple of k's to go. And we had um, Valentine on the bike just pretty much saying all the commands for us to do, which, which wasn't very many. But, yeah, the last few k's was pretty special when we knew for sure that was going to happen. And, yeah, the crowd support for the last kilometre was just insane. I think there was 120,000 people out there watching, someone said. So it was pretty special. Could you ever have imagined being part of such a historic run as a young boy growing up? Not really, yeah. It doesn't really come around all too often. But <laughs> I remember watching the um, Sub 2 event in um, 2017, a couple of years ago, and I just thought that was such a cool event. I was actually in um, Stanford at the time racing a 5k and i remember watching it before before my race there just thinking wow this is just amazing and then yeah obviously straight after london was when they announced ineos and then um my coach nick um got brett and i involved with that and we just jumped at the opportunity so yeah it's pretty cool to be involved pretty early on and you know you mentioned breaking two there jack uh robbie ketcher i think it is the aerodynamic sports scientist who was part of breaking two with the the formation of, of pace makers then also was yeah. in obviously the catalyst there for ineos 159 uh with that open v and you know to the uninitiated you think how could that work and then two runners behind yeah, elliot uh when you first saw that formation i mean obviously you were just trusting the experts but uh what were you thinking and, and how did it actually feel obviously you were there one month early to test that formation and you had that far yeah. far front right so what was it like trying to f- form the formation and hold it for the test event which was six weeks before Ineos, the proper event. Um, yeah, we got shown the formation and then everyone was just looking at it going, how does that work? It just looks so unorthodox. But, yeah, we kind of tr- practised the formation uh, for a day or so um, on the first day of the test event and it did feel a little unnatural at the start. But then um, once you kind of got the hang of it and then without the lasers, it, it became fine. And then with the, with the car there, with the green lasers, it has all the lines you have to run on and the, and the perfect pace. So... Yeah, once you got the hang of that, it, it became second nature. 
And were you looking, uh, you know, where were you putting your gaze? Obviously, you had to stick on that bright green laser dot and you had to stay within the yellow guidelines. But, yeah. you know, where were you directing your gaze? Well, it was actually a bit a bit tricky because at the test event, they had the car on the, um, the laser on the car and it was only five meters in front of us. And then we kind of got used to that. And then when we got there for the proper event, they um, wanted it further away. So they had it on the roof of the car instead of behind the car. So it was 15 metres, which is um, quite a big difference. And it kind of, the laser was a lot less clear for the proper event. And it kind of, any bump on the road, it would kind of cause the laser to um, sway a little bit. So you kind of just had to get used to running that pace and not worrying so much that you weren't perfectly on the line. And they did add an, an extra line so you weren't looking straight down at your feet. So there was another line um, three metres in front of us. So you could kind of just look at that one and not so worry about it so much. So interesting. And what was your greatest fear, Jack, leading into it? I don't know. I didn't really want to worry about it too much. But, yeah, it would be maybe um, feeling not so good in the second um, second round of pacing. So it was a little bit strange because that never really happens in a race where you have to run hard once for 10 or 15 minutes and then have an hour. Well, in my case, it was 90 minutes before my next one. So it was kind of like, do you do a cool down and you sit around for a bit and then you have to do another warm up? So it was a little bit strange. But um, yeah, the first sort of 500 meters of the second one, I was like, wow, this is, a, this is going to be a little bit tough. But then with the crowd and everything, and once you got warmed up, it, it became fine. So what did you do, Jack? You were the, the bookends, the start and the finish. Uh, what did you do in between? Uh, from photos on Instagram, it looked like you were in a bit of a lounge environment watching the, uh, watching the race unfold, the yeah. event unfold. Yeah, so we just did a normal sort of 20-minute 20, 20 warm-up before the first event. And then uh, the first leg was just under 4 Ks, so it was quite – quite short compared to the other ones and then after that i did a uh, 2k cool down and then we kind of just sat around in the tent that they had set up with all the other paces and the pace groups so each pace group had their own room with um and they had a manager for each pace group so there was kind of someone looking after us once we're back in the tent and then telling us when we need to go warm up and stuff yeah and then i did my um next warm up with bernard legat and then yeah we pretty much before we knew it, we're out on the out on the course, ready to go for round two. Bernard Legat, former guest at this show, uh, obviously a running yep. icon. Uh, having Bernard as the you know Kip as the the captain there, that must have been yeah. quite something quite special for you as well. Bernard, what were some of his instructions to the team? Oh, I think it was just pretty similar to all the other captains. He was just trying to keep everyone in line. Really, our group was the exact same as the um, test event, so we kind of everyone knew each other from that. I think uh, a lot of the other groups had new people coming in and out. But our group stayed the same, so I think we all worked quite well together. So, yeah, Bernard was definitely a great captain, and uh, he always had something to say with the um, testing and stuff. Yeah, he was always the first person to make suggestions or changes. And then obviously, uh, Jack, you shared this with some of your Melbourne Track Club uh, teammates, Pat Tiernan, Brett Robertson, Stuart McSwain. That must have been yeah. quite a quite a, a feeling as well, sharing that with with not only the world but you know your training mates. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's very different to racing but yeah it's it's not so often that all those guys come together and you're actually working together in a team yeah no amazing well done for flying the aussie flag guys i think everyone every australian runner was beaming with pride yeah it was amazing <laughs> how many people watched and uh, actually got involved with it it was cool but, but, but would that surprise you really i mean uh historic run first time in history were you surprised by how much interest it garnered yeah uh like even people that aren't into running were just messaging me about it and then saying oh, i saw you running in this and i'm like wow it really has reached almost across the world <laughs> yeah everyone's yeah. everyone's eyes were on it and i don't think anyone even if they weren't a runner really probably had a dry eye at the end it was just one of those moving moving moments of uh you yeah. know historic moments definitely that last um the last kilometer was really something special running behind him and just watching him cross the line with 20 seconds under the pace that he was going for it's just yeah pretty amazing and, and were there any words from Elliot to yourself jack as one of the pacemakers there at the end i really appreciate you all were given these pretty cool looking trophies uh and the party was yeah. pretty pretty, um, pretty wild as well <laughs> yeah it was it was good fun uh, not so much. Elliot kind of got swamped straight after the finish, and then um, yeah, everyone everyone wanted to get a photo with him and whatnot. And then he had to do drug testing and stuff. But yeah, we didn't really get to see him again until later that night, where he did a bit of a speech, which was pretty cool. Yeah, brilliant, Jack. There are a bunch of listener questions, and given given the interest in uh, in the Ineos One Five Nine, if you don't mind, I'm going to throw a few at you. So you ready for a bit of Q and A? Yeah. I mean, this is obvious. There's been lots of talk about it, and uh, you know, someone's asked here. 
do you, Jack, truly believe the the vapor flies, the, the Nike shoes, you know, gave an advantage? Oh, I'd say that definitely help you out. But I don't know. It's it's hard to say how much. I think everybody's different. The way everyone runs. Obviously, Elliot had a different pair to the um, Vaporfly Next Percents, which all the paces were wearing. But um, putting those shoes on anyone else, I think um, he'd still pretty much be the only person to um, break the two-hour barrier. Regardless of the shoes, I think it was still a pretty amazing feat. <laughs> yeah, uh, I agree. I mean, uh, too much talk on that. I think it detracts from the incredible performance. Uh, Jack, yeah, definitely. how did uh, – this is Jack uh, Jack Smith on the Gold Coast. How did you come up with who was in, in the team and, and why some people did two – two runs and some did uh, three. We don't really know how they came up with the teams, but yeah, they um, they just had it all decided pretty much in a test event and then they pretty much stuck with that. And then with all the new people coming in, they just divided them through the other groups, but not in the first group. So, um, and then they had six or seven reserves as well. So there was just, yeah, there's a lot of guys there and I don't know how they figured out who's running what, but some people even ran three times. So yeah. there's a couple of guys in my group that ran three times. So and I mean to start there on the on the start line and the finish, what a what a what a, this, that's uncanny, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely nuts. uncanny. Uh, Jack Baroness three thousand asks, uh, what key idea has Jack taken from his involvement with the challenge? And in Jack's opinion, what does he think uh, is the biggest impact that this will have on the the running community? I'd say it just shows with a pretty much a well organized team and careful planning um, that you can really exceed any of the expectations um so any us yeah i've never been to an event that was planned everything just down to a t so uh, i think it, it all just came together on the day and it really paid off for elliot yeah uh and the biggest impact um i'd say it, it not only on the elite marathon world but i think everyone everyone involved with the marathon it's had an impact on i think elliot's just um pretty much a perfect role model for so many people and um yeah, just a perfect example of um, hard work and dedication, what, what that can do for you. Yeah, fantastic. What do you most admire about him, Jack? I'd just say the most the thing I most admire, just how humble he is. Yeah, he's just got such a buzz about him. Like everyone everyone really just really looks up to him and um, you'd really struggle to find something to dislike about him. Where do you think that humility comes from? Good question. <laughs> I'm not sure. A, a question of my own. Uh, here, you know, in one of the promo videos, you commented that mentally he was, you know, Elliot's at top of his uh, the top of his game, and that the mental side plays a bigger part than most people think. What did you mean by that? Yeah, oh, half the battle of running distance events would be in your mind. So I'd say, um, yeah, he's just I don't know how he's done it, but he's just so much stronger than a lot of people think. Um, yeah, and he he really believes in himself. And it, yeah, it just shows through his running that he, he doesn't stutter or fault really anywhere, any at any point through the marathon. And um, yeah, it is something I don't know. Not all people have that ability. I'd say Elliot is just a standout. Yeah, I don't know. It's something a lot of people need to figure out how they can improve in their mental toughness. Speaking with Alex Hutchinson, uh, author, journalist who covered Breaking Two, and in, in the lead up to yep. it, one of the things that he was most stunned with was the belief the sheer self-belief that Elliot had uh it really uh it really uh took his breath away uh when he asked Elliot how are you going to run two back-to-back sub one hour half marathons and he said I've something along the lines of I'm going to think different <laughs> you know I'm going to think yeah. different <laughs> um and you know yeah, exactly. Alex is waiting for some new training recipe uh you'll like this one Jack Herbert says the mustache it drove the girls crazy he was definitely the man of the race how did Jack enjoy the crowd in Vienna? It's a little bit of a light-hearted one there, but, but obviously everyone wants to know about the moustache. Uh, you've been, you know, likened to street Steve Prefontaine. So, uh, what's the story behind the yeah. moustache? To be honest, there's not really a story behind it. <laughs> I just, um, I've had it for a couple of years now, and I didn't really like shaving, so I just thought, ah, I kind of like the look of it, so I'll just keep it. I did get rid of it um, in February, and then I kind of had a bit of a bad race, so I just grew it back. <laughs> well, well, I think uh, it's a trademark now, Jack, so it's on your face for a while to come. Yeah. Uh, good, good yeah, question. I might have to keep it for a little while. <laughs> I think so. Miss Jungle asks, does Jack believe Elliot can repeat it under race conditions? Uh, I think mm, that's a tough question. I think eventually it will happen. I don't know if it will be Elliot, uh, but a lot of things would have to go right for it for someone to run under two hours in a proper race. I think they'll need to get uh, a, probably a 
decent group of um, paces to take them to at least 30 k's of the race, and they'd have to have perfect conditions on a perfect day on a good course. Then I think it can be done, but I don't know. I don't know how long, but I think it will happen. And then uh, Herbert asks there, following that question, Jack, could it have been faster? Uh, definitely. I think um, the whole idea of the thing was just to break two hours. They didn't want to. Um, they didn't want to set out for say 159 flat pace, and then something goes wrong. Say. 35 k's in and then he ends up blowing up a bit so i think they just wanted to aim as close to two hours as they could and then yeah just with that last kilometer obviously if he's feeling good he can pick it up so i think that's what happened and then he ran 159 40 and dropped that 240 in there at the end yeah the car was the car was always set for that 159 50 pace so pretty much 250 every kilometer um, a few of the splits were a bit out, but that was actually false. The car was going the exact same pace the whole way. So the the splits that we saw, I mean, there was very minor variations, but they were pretty bang on 250 yeah. the whole way. Yeah, it did come up as variations on the clock, but the car was actually a constant pace. So the, the times were a little bit out, those splits. It was all 250s. And at the practice events, Jack asks here, Jack asks Jack, uh, how much you know? How much time was devoted to that formation? You said you got together six weeks before, but were there prior run-throughs prior to that? Uh, no, so it was just pretty much at the test event. They there was a few meetings just explaining all the um, changeover zones and the formations you had to run in, and then out on the course, it was actually a fair few hours we put into the practice. Um, it wasn't so smooth at the start, but. Um, we kind of they changed the um, transition zones. They did, they had us um, exiting a different way when the new pace groups came in, and they changed the the way we exited. Um, that was actually Bernard the Gats' idea. And then um, yeah, after just practicing that and nailing that, we kind of you got the hang of it. And then come the actual event, it went really smooth. Yeah. No. Well, Jack, uh, moving off Ineos one five nine. Well done, mate. What a what a remarkable thing to be part of. Cheers. Yeah, it was great. You're listening to Aussie running sensation Jack Rayner on this, a featured performer episode as Jack shares his career, highs, lows, and learnings. Today's episode is brought to you by Physiocrem. Physiocrem is a topical massage cream containing natural plant-based ingredients ideal for the temporary relief of muscular aches and pains. If you're conscious of what you put on your body, you'll be happy to know that Physiocrem does not contain parabens or hydroxybenzoates, and its non-greasy formula doesn't leave any sticky residue behind. Physiocrem can be found Australia-wide at your local Coles, chemist or health store, as well as their online store. They've also offered a 20% discount to listeners of The Physical Performance Show. Use the coupon code POGO, P-O-G-O, when you shop at physiocram.com.au. Hurting sucks and Physiocram have got your back. Today's show is also brought to you by POGO Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. Our philosophy is simple. We just want to help you get from being injured back to your physical best, completing your rehabilitation and across what we term the physio finish line. Now to get you there, we do not want to see you for a single session more than what you require. We just want to see you back to your physical best and doing the things that you love to do. To find out more about Pogo Physio's award-winning services, including our one-hour initial appointment or our very popular online telehealth consultations, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. For now, let's jump back with Jack Rayner sharing on his career highs, lows and learnings on this A Featured Performer episode. And Jack, talking about remarkable things to be part of, you're moving from one historic event to you know another historic uh, monumental running event, and that's obviously the New York City Marathon coming up at the time of recording, uh, only a matter of a week and a little bit away at the time of episode release. Yeah. It'll be two days prior. So Jack, yeah, right. uh, New York Marathon, what's the target there and what's, what's the strategy? So New York's obviously a little bit different to a few of the other uh, marathon majors or not just majors but other marathons around just with the um a few rolling hills in the course but uh i'm not going to worry so much about the time i just want to be racing and it's be in contention a little bit longer because I've, I've only ever done one marathon which was london and um pretty much from the gun i was out of the race uh i just was with the um 
third pace group, I think, there. So I um, kind of just ran within myself and I just wanted to hit um, – I knew I wanted to hit around the Olympic qualifying time. So um, I was lucky enough to go under that. So for New York, I will just um, – not worry so much about the time, but just um, actually race it this time. And I mean, London was your debut two two eleven oh six. You finished in fourteenth place. Yeah. It's still quite a impressive debut. Uh, a Tokyo twenty twenty qualifying time, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So the qualifier was two eleven thirty. So yeah, I was pretty stoked to get under that on my first go. So that was great. And leading into the marathon, Jack uh, Matt from Sweat Elite who did want me to pass on that he was going to meet you at a Marriott hotel there in Vienna, but I think you got the you guys got the wrong Marriott. So, but oh, I think, yeah, there was two Marriotts. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, we're, yeah. Matt, uh, Matt asks, so leading into the marathon, what's the, the toughest training session that you undertake and then which one do you find most mentally challenging, specifically in marathon preparation? Um, so we've had two of the pretty similar sessions, so one before London and one we did – just last week on Saturday, uh, both of them were around 40 k's. So, the one we did before London, it was a 90-minute run at like 4:10 pace, and then we changed our shoes, put on vapor flies, and then did um, 20 minutes of one-minute hard, one-minute float. So it was around for the whole 20 minutes, that was around 3 3:10 or 3:15 average pace, and then we'd had a one-kilometer float, and then we had an eight-kilometer threshold. Um, that was around three or five pace or something, and then a one kilometer float, and then a five kilometer threshold, and then a cool down. So that was a that was our big session before London, and we did a pretty similar one just on Saturday. Um, so yeah, that's the biggest session we'll do in yeah. a lead up. Yeah, wow. And the most mentally challenging? We do a session that's uh, twenty kilometers of one kilometer hard, one kilometer float. So that's the hard efforts are in about three minute pace, and then the floats in three thirties. Um, the session we did before London, I found that probably the most challenging just because I must have been a little bit tired. But um, this time we've done it a few more times and it's been a bit easier. But, yeah, I think that was the hardest session I've done. Yeah, wow, some uh, so, some great work there, Jack. This has been quite a rise for you. You've had half marathon wins in Cardiff. I believe that's still your PB, 101.01 in 2018. Yep. Uh, yep. There's some uh, some beautiful symmetry there. The Gold Coast Marathon, obviously, you're a crowd favourite there uh, with, with victories. And then two Sunny Coast half marathon victories, really a third this year in 2019. But obviously, there was that incident with the, the car directing you. Oh, it was uh, last year and then this year's DQ, so pretty much only one. Win. Okay, so we could call <laughs> yeah. it two, but yeah, technically uh, yeah. technically one. And someone did ask, actually, one of the, the show listeners, Jack, how you bounce back from that disappointment, uh, you know, you know, in, on the Sunshine Coast. So obviously, these things happen. Yeah, uh, there's not, nothing I could really do. So I knew it wasn't my fault, so there was no point being down about it. And, um I knew I had other races coming up, so just yeah, kind of not worried about it at all and then just focused on what was coming up. So, yeah, I didn't let it get to me. No, well, that you did in, in fine form and style, so credit to you. I mean, you're young in years too, Jack, uh, 24 or 25 at the moment? I'm um, 23. Sorry, 23. Don't let me uh, age you prematurely. Uh, Jack, yeah, I mean... my birthday's in a month or so. Oh, oh there you go. So 24 very soon. Uh, happy yeah. birthday in advance. But, you know, <laughs> young in years, uh, many runners, you know, transition over to the marathon on the road, you know, towards the sort of uh, more twilight part of their career. Obviously, it's a conscious decision with yourself and, and coach Nick Badeau to to take you over there, you know, at this age. So can you outline a little bit about the rationale and thinking and decisions behind that? Well, sort of when I joined the group in 2017, I still didn't really know what my distance was going to be. So I was kind of, I had a bit of a year on the track there, but I, I didn't really break through. I think I ran, yeah, 13, 1341 on the track. So I was kind of quite a way off running any times close to world champs or Olympic qualifiers. So 2018 rolled around and then I had another go at nationals and kind of bonked there. So um, Nick told me it was probably time to stay in Australia instead of going overseas um, for the European season. So I just did some road races here and I really started to find um, that I liked road running a lot more than the track. And then, um, yeah, I did a few half marathons and then won the Cardiff half marathon. And then a a week after that, I got home and then um, Melbourne Marathon was on and Nick said, yeah, you can pace Sinead, Sinead Diver. And um, I paced Sinead till 37 Ks there. And then um, pretty much a week after that, Nick said, do you want to run London Marathon next year? And I said, yeah, why not? Yeah, pretty much started the marathon build up in a bit after February this year. And then, yeah, 
now I'm at New York. <laughs> and, and here you are. And uh, what's the greatest thing? I mean, Nick Badeau, uh, you know, acclaimed coach, coach of so many uh, incredible athletes. Uh, what's the biggest learning you've taken from uh, being part of the Melbourne Track Club, Jack? Well, I'm just surrounded by so many influential people here in the Melbourne Track Club. Um, yeah, they're just the faith he puts into all these athletes. Um, he just puts them in a good mindset. I'd say. So ever since I joined the group, I pretty much improved straight away. And then um, I was able to achieve my first world cross country team like two or three months after joining the group. So I'd say as soon as I joined, I just started improving. So yeah. Uh, Yeah. Just the training and then how much faith he has in his athletes really shows. And are there any examples of the faith in the athletes? Is it words spoken or just gestures or how does that faith get uh, seeped in, yeah. you know, into, a, into one of the athletes. A bit of a mixture of everything. Just um, the way he talks to you at, at training sessions or after training, um, the training he sets for you. Yeah, a, bu- a bunch of things. It just yeah, it doesn't happen instantly, but yeah, I'd say he puts everyone in, in a pretty pretty good mindset all the time, especially leading up to a big race. What were the words of advice for, you know, Ineos? Obviously, we weren't racing per se, but, you know, you're about to be part of history. Uh, he didn't say so much for Ineos, but uh, he, he knew we were capable of running the set paces. So he knew it wasn't, wasn't like a really big challenge for us. So he didn't really need to say too much there. What percentage of your output do you think the, the 1430, I think it was, 5, 5K splits were uh, 250 per K? What, what percentage of Jack Rayner's output was that? 80%, 75 85. Uh, <laughs> good question. I don't. I don't really know. But we were, um, Brett and I were joking the other day, saying how long could you have stuck on that pace for? And then we both said, "Oh, about about a half marathon. I reckon maybe 22 k's." <laughs> yeah, okay, come on, boys. That's awesome. So uh, there's your uh, there's your sub one uh, one hour half. Yeah. And uh, who know, who knows? It was it was would have been cool to test it out. But yeah. Yeah. Probably absolutely. won't get a chance again. Well, well, it was uh, one historic day. Uh, Jack, yeah. uh, before you joined Nick, uh, rewinding the clock, how did Jack Rayner even find himself, you know, pursuing a career in running? Was, it, was there a catalytic moment where you're like, okay, uh, I'm really quite gifted here, or was it just more of a slow burn through your developmental years? Uh, yeah, so I actually got into running at quite a young age. I think I was seven or eight at the time. But, um, yeah, my parents – my brother was – doing basketball and Oz kick and stuff like that. And then when it was his, he's two years older than me. So when it was my time to um, go down and do that, I absolutely hated it. So um, uh, yeah, ran off the field crying at Oz kick. And then um, my parents were just looking for a sport for me to do. And then they, um, one of the neighbors just suggested going down to cross country. So um, yeah, started running and then yeah, been doing that ever since. And I got a coach probably when I was nine years old, so Keith Fernley, and he coached me up until I joined the Melbourne Track Club, so only a couple of years ago. So I was with him for, yeah, over 10 years. And was there much junior success? Uh, yeah, so I made probably my first national team in the cross country in 2006 and then went to almost every national cross country up until under 20s. Yeah, and I never really um, had any success on the track until I was 17 where I won the national champs for the 5K. So that's kind of, kind of when I started to improve, around 17 years old. And the national cross-country outings, Jack, were you ever podium, you know, picking up podiums at those? As a junior, I came close. I was fourth and fifth a couple of times. And then uh, in under-20s, I won it. So that was probably my best result for a junior. And, yeah. and when did your belief kick in that, okay, I'm going to pursue this with all I've got? Good question. Um. After school, I um, didn't really know what I was going to do. I was obviously still running. I was running up half decently, and then um, I worked landscaping for a couple of years, and then I kind of didn't really like that so much. And then I was still improving on the roads, like doing fun runs and stuff. So then I, I thought, uh, why not just put everything into running? And, um, yeah, that's when I joined the Melbourne Truck Club and then, yeah, started to getting a little bit better after that. Yeah, and you're on the rise. Uh, Jack, uh, obviously Tokyo 2020 uh, is is part of the plan. So looking ahead to Tokyo, uh, yeah. what steps need to be taken to, to get you on the team and secondly, ready for that start line? So, so far, they're going to take up to three people. So Brett and I are the only two Aussies with the qualifier. I think Liam's very close as well. He's six seconds off. Um yeah, so we'll just be ticking off New York, hopefully having a good run there. And then um, I'll look at doing another marathon early next year. 
Uh, don't really know which one. But, yeah. Um, and then, fingers crossed, we'll be on the um, Olympic team for Tokyo. It's actually not in Tokyo, the Olympic marathon. You've probably heard they've moved it to support. Yeah, just just a matter of uh, maybe a week ago or not even that. So has, yeah. is that going to change things for you, maybe just a little bit cooler? Yeah, I uh, don't really know. <laughs> it's um, quite a distance away from Tokyo. I think it's 800 kilometres away. So uh, it would be interesting to see where they take us. Hopefully, well, who knows? They'll probably keep us in Tokyo if we make the team and then fly us to support a few days before the race or something. Don't really know. Or a good a good one month of training there, uh, run there, 200k a week, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're listening to Aussie running sensation Jack Rayner sharing on the highs, lows and learnings of his career to date. If you missed last week's episode, it was part two of an exploration into all things bone stress injury management for the endurance athlete. It featured US physical therapists Nathan Carlson and Chris Johnson on a roundtable discussion on bone stress injuries. Here's a little snippet of what you missed. Consulting with a with a coach that will be honest with you. I think that, you know, when you train for events of this nature, whether it's you're a 5K runner or you do, you know, Ironman triathlon, it's not comfortable. Training's hard. It's time consuming. It's a big time investment. But I think that having someone that will be realistic for you and keep you in check is really, really important. Whether that's a coach, a trainer, a teammate, you know, I, I think that having someone that's going to be honest with you, but supportive is really important. To tune into the full episode, be sure to jump over to wherever it is that you enjoy your podcast from. And whilst there, peruse the archives dating right back episode one featuring surf life-saving Ironman champion Ali Day. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured performer, Aussie running sensation Jack Rayner. Jack, uh, you ready for a performance round? Sure. This this will be quicker than the Ineos 159, so uh, here we go. Jack, uh, we asked some marathon-specific questions there before, but training session most disliked? Probably a track, track sessions. Um we don't do them too often, but um, there's a grass track we train out in Waverley, and we've had some uh, killer workouts there that I find very, very hard. So either one of them. They're always different, so I can't can't say one off the top of my head. But, yeah, very lactic and very hard. <laughs> Training session most loved? Maybe one kilometre reps just because you, you always know what you're going to get, and, um, yeah, it's the same each time, each time you do it. So I'd say that's one of my favourites. And what sort of rest are you having if you're doing 1K repeats? Uh, We'll do eight with one minute rest. I also really like the uh, at Falls Creek. We do eight hundred meter hills, so that's a pretty tough session. But I enjoy that one too. That that one's a little bit Instagram famous, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a good looking hill. Favorite pre race meal? What fuels Jack Rayner? Favorite would probably be pizza. So I think I had pizza before every race I did last year, but then uh, this year it's been a bit different because I'll just eat at the hotel if they're putting food on. But yeah. Rice, pasta, that kind of thing. And the day, the morning of or the day of? I'll have either Morton, like it depends how far the race is, but a bottle or half a bottle of Morton, a banana, and then toast or oats or something like that. Uh, bedtime morning time, Jack, what's that look like for you? <laughs> I could be a lot better with this, but uh, yeah, around 11 and I wake up at around 8. Jack, who's the athlete you most admire and why? Probably a pretty obvious answer, but uh, probably at the moment, Elliot Kipchoge, um, just because there's so much to like about him. I think um, he's taught a lot of people so much about the marathon, and um, yeah, he's just, I think, yeah, so many people look up to him, so yeah, he'd be mine. And definitely my training partner, Brett. Yeah, as you said, and uh, I mean, Brett's been nominated before for this, Jack, as the athlete most admired by Stuart McSwain, so obviously he has yeah. quite an impression on, you know, you younger up-and-coming runners. Yeah, he takes a lot of the um, younger guys in the group under his wing, and just offers any advice that he can, so yeah, he's he's helped me a lot. Yeah, brilliant. Toughest competitor you've ever raced, Jack, who's that and why? Hmm. As a junior, it might have been Stewie. I raced him quite a lot, but I'm trying to think now. There's no one that really sticks out. That's, I don't know. I've, I've raced Brett a few times, and he's bloody hard to beat, so he could be <laughs> one of the competitors. There you go. Brett's, uh, Brett's jumping in again. Uh, yeah. Jack, is there a mantra that you use or have regularly on loop when you're racing or training for that matter? No. <laughs> I don't really have a mantra. No. 
I just like to keep things pretty simple, really. Keep it simple. So, yeah. Best recovery yeah. tip, Jack, what's that? Eating a lot after any workout or run. Pretty much after any run, I'll just get a protein shake and then eat a lot of food if it's a hard workout. So, yeah. Keeping it simple. not to like about that? Keeping it simple, Jack. I like it. Jack, worst yeah. injury to date? I've been pretty lucky, touch wood, but um, worst injury, probably a few years ago, I just had a problem just kind of with my glutes not firing properly and I, my hips were kind of out of alignment. And um, yeah, I was lucky enough to get that fixed without really taking any any major time off. But yeah, it just was a bit painful running for a month or so. So yeah, I've been lucky. That's great. So there's been no bone stress injuries or tendon problems or anything like that? No, nah, I've um, had a little bit of a tendon issues just in the last couple of months, but I've been on top of that at the moment. So that's good. Yeah, brilliant. Keep it that way, Jack. Jack, one word to describe your racing style. Uh, patient. Very nice. How would you describe being in the zone? Hmm. Everything coming together and um, not feeling like you're really killing yourself. And when was the last time you were in the zone? Maybe pacing <laughs> in EOS. I was going to say you would be hard-pressed to, to pass that up, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jack, uh, final question in this performance round. What's the hardest bit of a fun one, hardest session you have ever done? Uh, I've done a few hard sessions recently, but uh, – I don't know. There's not, nothing really where I've been like absolutely dead at the end of a session. But um, maybe in the build-up for London, just when I was really tired, some of the runs there were um, very, very hard. I think um, one day we had to do a two-and-a-half-hour run in the morning, and then in the evening we had to kind of do a faster afternoon run at three-minute 30 pace. But, yeah, that felt... That felt like I was uh, going all out. <laughs> yeah, wow, the fatigue. And, I mean, leading into, you know, your New York Marathon prep, the question every runner always wants to know, you know, looking at the elites is, you know, what's the volume been like? But my questions would be, one, what's your volume been like? And, two, what's the intensity distribution, you know, been if you had to look at sort of steady stuff to, to effort as a percentage? So volume, we're probably running not each week's exactly the same, but trying to hit uh, – at minimum 160 kilometers per week and then up to almost 190. So I know some guys are doing a lot more than that, but, um, yeah, I'm still trying to find really what works for me. And, um, yeah, if I run 190, I'll be quite tired for the workouts. So, yeah, there's kind of a fine balance there. You know, you mentioned uh, find out what works for you. What what have you discovered about fueling for the marathon, hydration and also, you know, uh, energy intake? Yeah, so it's still very, very new to me. Um, trying to just get used to running workouts and taking on fluids um, while you're running hard, which is half the problem. So I've just been using Morton. So trying to practice getting them down sort of in a longer session, sort of every five kilometers. But yeah, it is, uh, it's quite a skill trying to drink and running at a hard pace and then, yeah, getting it all down and not, not feeling like it's going to affect you. So for London, what, what was your strategy there? We ran two hour eleven. Uh, so yeah, I just had um, a bottle of Morton in the morning before the race, and then every there's a drink station every five k's. So I had just uh, it was 125 mils of Morton in each bottle, and then in one of my bottles I had just flat Coke that was at 35 k's, and then I had a Morton gel taped to the bottle. So kind of changed things up a little bit at that stage of the race, just when you're kind of struggling there. So it was good to have a bit of sugar, like instead of the Morton. And, um, yeah, I think for New York, it'll be pretty similar. They've got drink stations every 5Ks, but there's none, none at 40Ks, so there's only seven stations. And, um, yeah, I think they've got a new Morton caffeine gel, so I'll practice using that in our training. Yeah, brilliant. With Elliot, uh, observing Elliot, what, were, were there any learnings from Elliot's fueling or nutrition strategy for Ineos 159? Uh, yeah, so he was pretty lucky. In Ineos, they actually had a um, well Valentine on the bike passing him all these drinks and gels. So I think he had a, a gel taped to every bottle so he could kind of pick which one he wanted to have, if he wanted to have gel or, or the drink mix. Um, and, yeah, it was all pretty much perfectly measured out for him. They had all the bottles at a stable temperature. Uh, they figured out – I don't know what temperature it was, but they figured out which is the best for it to be absorbed into your body. Um, but yeah, it'll be pretty similar to, um, New York just with the fuel. 
And obviously they uh, they popped Elliot on the, the scales there at the end, which Shalane Flanagan commented, you know, how fantastic that they had uh, in, a, in the excitement of the moment. They still had the discipline to, to gather data. Uh, were you weighed as yeah. well? And have you weighed yourself uh, post your marathons to pre? Uh, no, I have never, don't even worry about weighing myself, but yeah, yeah. I saw they were doing, they were testing all sorts of stuff there. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I just try and keep on top of my diet as much as I can. Yep. Uh, not, not worry so much about how much I weigh. Smart. Uh, Jack, you use the word patient when I asked you to describe your racing style. And for many runners, uh, myself included over the years, that's probably the, uh, the one word that I would like to attribute but I can't <laughs> to myself. Where does that patience come from at such a young age? You know, 23 about to turn 24. Uh, what what underpins this this trait of patience? I don't really know. I think it just comes naturally. I, I like running uh, in a race. I like being in, in a pack, not so much running just out by myself. I think anytime you're in a pack, it makes running a fair bit easier. And then um, trying to feel as relaxed as I can um, for as long as I can. And then you get that from being patient and then... I like to, uh, yeah, give it everything in the last little bit of a race where you can actually sh- show what you got. And have you gotten that wrong before where you haven't been patient and you've paid for it? Definitely when I was younger, yeah, going out too hard and then blowing up. But, yeah, kind of, yeah, when, when you're racing a lot, you kind of get used to racing well. And, um, yeah, there's been times where, where I haven't been patient. I think uh, or when I've been a bit sick or something, it just things haven't fallen into place and it's just, uh, yeah, produced a average result so yeah you've learned from uh learned from your your errors in uh in retrospect jack uh i've got to ask you about the you know the vapor flies the next percent i actually popped them on just recently uh at a super league triathlon event where one of the athletes had the same size shoe as myself and so same oh, yeah. <laughs> same size foot size foot so i popped yeah. them on and and i really wasn't prepared for what you know i knew there'd be some rebound but i just I was quite amazed at the the feeling, the the carbon fiber. I felt like I could get the return. What was your first reaction when you had the first opportunity to wear the shoes? Yeah, I um, first wore them in the Launceston 10K last year. So I didn't even do it. I didn't do any training runs or any strides in them. I just chucked them on straight away. And, um, yeah, I loved them from the second I wore them. Um, yeah, I think you just pull up so much better after wearing them. Just your legs get saved towards the later stage of a race where you start your calves and stuff start hurting. It just doesn't really happen in the vapor flyers. Um, yeah, they do. They do kind of take a little bit to get used to the feel of them. But yeah, I think they're pretty amazing. Jack, uh, this show is about the highs, the lows, the learnings. Has it been a darkest day in your running career to date? Nothing that really jumps out at me. I'm still pretty green behind the, the ears of my career. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah, no, great. Well, uh, let's you know, it's probably inevitable it will come uh, at at some point. Yeah. But uh, it's great that thus far you you are really just on the rise, Jack. Learnings, top three tips from Jack Rayner for the marathon runner. What would Jack's top three marathon tips be? Number one, listening to your body, taking um, time off or afternoons off when you um, don't necessarily need to keep digging yourself a hole if you're feeling tired consistency just um building upon layers and layers of weeks without really killing yourself so um yeah the other thing would be mentally preparing yourself for a race um i think yeah you plan so much about getting yourself fit but sometimes your your mind's not ready to race so i'd say yeah getting used to that and on that mental preparation is there any practical things that you do jack uh do you work with a sports psychologist there with athletics australia uh, i have met with one but yeah i only saw him once and i didn't feel the need to see him again but yeah i think um it's pretty much yeah it's hard to describe how you can get mentally tough um but yeah i think a lot of it comes naturally yeah, it'd be interesting to see how you can improve that. I don't really know. Yeah, no. Well, uh, well, time will, will tell for you, Jack. Uh, consistency. I mean, that's given. You you, you mentioned the word. You know, build. Uh, and one of your fellow uh, Melbourne Track Club teammates shared that some time ago. Ryan Gregson, where he said, "I see every session as a building block. It's just a yeah. you know, it's it's a it's a it's a foundational step on the bigger picture to my athletic best." And that makes me ask, you know, obviously, is this something that Nick speaks about, your coach, Nick Badeau, that, you know, guys, this is just a, a building block, a step in the right direction? Definitely. He, um, yeah, looks at like sort of building 
a lot of the base fitness in training camps and stuff and then um yeah sharpening up before a big race so yeah and then the other tip you had there jack which i just think is absolutely brilliant listening to your body uh how do you jack manage to do that do you rely on any data do you take questionnaires of your mood do you look at heart rate variability or you know are you data driven with that uh, or are you more subjective just on how you're feeling uh not so much data driven i do keep an eye on my heart rate for a lot of runs but um yeah mainly just if i'm ever feeling tired just take back off a bit uh i think what helped me last year was i was kind of training um without most of the group back at home in melbourne so i was kind of just going off my own feel and i was never really pushing myself every single session which i was um, when the whole group's there, you kind of someone's always going to be having a good day, which will kind of push the whole group on. So it was kind of nice, um, just training to your own level for a little bit. Brilliant, Jack. Uh, strength work does that play much of a, a part for you? Uh, yes, I haven't really been doing too much strength work, but um, yeah, I've got a program from the guys at the VIS, so I've been just doing that once or twice a week. So it's pretty pretty basic stuff and a bit of core stuff. So. Nothing, nothing too high tech. You know, what are some of the exercises you'd be getting around with in that that program? A few different kind of squats, a few um, lunges, calf raises, and then lots of core stuff, and um, yeah, and a few stability things as well, like with the Bosu bowl, um, and then Theraband stuff. So yeah, nothing too crazy. Jack, uh, here's a fun one. Uh, Jack Rayner can have three people at a dinner table, living or past. Who's at Jack Rayner's dinner table and why? <laughs> wow. Never really thought about this. Uh, three people at a dinner table. Hmm. Well, it'd be hard to go past people in my family, but that's probably a boring answer. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe my brother and then Brett and then third person. Do you want to come? Yeah, absolutely. I'll jump on that table. Uh, everyone's talking about Brett Robinson, so uh, I think I need to tag along on this one, Jack. Yeah, okay, perfect. Lock it in. And on the family, you mentioned you know, your brother. Uh, where do your athletic genes come from? Is there a bit of that in the lineage or are you surprised? I'd say maybe most of it came from my mom. She's, um, she was pretty athletic when she was younger. She was um, quite a good rower. Um, and then my dad's always been pretty athletic too, but he was never into any specific sports, but yeah, I'd say a lot of it came from my mum. Jack, uh, final few questions. If you could boil everything you've learned through your running years to date down to one piece of advice for listeners of this show who listen in to, 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 to find out tips and insights uh, on how they can perform at their own best physically, what would Jack Rayner's solitary piece of advice be? Don't take running for granted um, and then just enjoy it while you can. Don't take running for granted. Enjoy it while you can. And that, that that seems like quite a profound thing for a young runner, 23 years of age, to say. Where does that spring from? I don't really know, but I just um, I couldn't really imagine my life without running in it. So, um, yeah, just want to keep doing it for as long as I can. Oh, beautiful stuff, mate. Jack, uh, every guest of the show issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. So this can be something entry level. It can be something very challenging. Your teammate... There at Melbourne Track Club, Jen Lecars issued 20 pull-up challenge, which I think uh, you know has been a very high standard to set. So what's Jack Rayner's physical challenge for the week going to be? Well, I definitely couldn't do 20 pull-ups. So it might be something <laughs> a bit easier than that. Um, knocking out a gym session, just if you haven't been in a while, just getting down and getting one started. Because once you get the ball rolling, it's a bit easier to um, get into the routine of things and just doing it, maybe aiming for it once a week. Great stuff, and I'll, uh, I'll support Could that. It's yeah. a great physical challenge. Get in the gym uh, once this next week. Jack, uh, final two questions here. Where does your drive come from? Uh, I think I've always been pretty determined, so uh, I just like um, putting up good results on the board, so I'd say I'm pretty driven by that. And Jack, uh, with your running career or life, what mistakes are you afraid of making? What mistakes am I afraid of making? Um pushing myself too hard and then you know, getting some sort of injury. So I'm a bit afraid of that. And I guess that feeds back in, Jack, to, you know, as you say, not taking running for granted because, in your words, you couldn't imagine life without running. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, mate. You are wise wise ahead of your years, Jack, and uh, as, a, as a lover of all things running and Australian running, 
well done, mate, on uh, on the contribution you've been making recently and, and flying the flag. And Jack, uh, on behalf of listeners, we certainly wish you all the best for New York. We'll be following with great interest and uh, and then looking forward to 2020 Tokyo. Thanks so much, Brad. It's been a pleasure. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show, and I trust and I know that you enjoyed today's featured performer, Jack Rayner. What an incredible part that Jack played in what was such an incredible day, not just for the running community, but the world. Elliot Kipchoge's historic sub-two-hour marathon. Now, if you enjoyed Jack's sharings around the INEOS 159 Challenge, You'll also be heartened to know that the captain pacemaker Bernard Legat, US Olympic legend and former guest of the show, episode 77, is set to make a return appearance here on the Physical Performance Show to also talk about his experience on INEOS 159. So stay tuned for that episode release as well. Now, if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to reach out, let Jack know. He's easily found over on Instagram at Jack Rayner 7 That's R-A-Y-N-E-R the number seven. Whilst there, be sure to tag in the show at Physical Performance Show, plus or minus myself at Brad underscore beer. In particular, consider taking a podsy. That's a screenshot of the episode that you've enjoyed and tag the show in. It's a whole lot of fun to see those coming through. Be sure to jump over to the show notes for all relevant links, including YouTube footage of the historic INEOS 159 challenge and follow along for Jack's outcome for this weekend's New York City Marathon. A massive thanks to those leaving ratings and reviews for the show over on iTunes. It really is a whole lot of fun to see those come through. A massive shout out this week to Chris Zarb. Chris rated the show five stars and commented, love this podcast, up-to-date information from experts in an entertaining format. I look forward to it every week. Chris, thank you for taking the time to leave that review. If you've been enjoying the show and are yet to subscribe, please consider hitting subscribe. That truly is the best way to help the show grow. A massive thanks, as always, to the great folk who make the show possible week in and week out. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer. Matthew Olden on all things graphic design. Susan Wilkin on all things show administration. And Oliver Crossley helping behind the scenes. Another huge shout out to today's show sponsor for making the show possible, Physiocram. If you are yet to try Physiocram, it is a fantastic product. It is the cream of choice that we use at Pogo Physio. And don't forget, you can avail yourself of 20% off any of the products online by jumping over to Physiocram, F-I-S-I-O-C-R-E-M.com.au and using the promo code POGO, P-O-G-O, for 20% off all products. Now, coming up next week, boy, oh boy, you are in for a treat. I will bring you a conversation that I recently had with New York Times bestselling author, sports science journalist, Christy Ashwinden. Christy recently released an incredible publication titled Good To Go, what the athlete in all of us can learn from the strange science of recovery. Former Featured guest, also best-selling author Alex Hutchinson, the acclaimed author of Endure, on Christie's book commented, this is the most important book about training you'll read this year. And I have to agree. I devoured the pages of Good To Go inside three weeks. And the crux of the book is Christie's exploration of all things contemporary recovery strategies. Christie looks at it through the lens of science on an evidence continuum from fads and gimmicks through to the unbeatable and proven benefits of the most available recovery strategy being sleep. Christy explores all things including icing, the myths that we have adopted around hydration for endurance sports. She explores stretching, infrared saunas, float tanks, compression garments, supplements and cryotherapy chambers. What is a fascinating conversation and an even better read. So be sure to be tuning in next week for featured guest, New York Times bestselling author of Good To Go, Christy Ashwinden. Until then, keep pursuing your own physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been The Physical Performance Show.